the Calgary Stampeders refuse to lose. Jamar Wall with the interception. Thanks to last week's huge comeback, they're just a win away from tying the franchise record win total. But it won't be easy, because today, every bomber is auditioning for next season. Then in our second game. Look out. Tanner Marsh is match. Solomon Aluminium. Odell Willis has the tumbling again. The league's elite defenses take center stage as the Lions and Eskimos face off in a possible preview of the West semifinal. And with home field still up for grabs, expect the intensity to be cranked up. It's a CFL doubleheader Saturday, and it's next. Peters have had first place locked up for two weeks, but that means nothing to that man, Bo Levi Mitchell. He wants to get out there and play as much as his head coach, John Huffnagel, will allow. Welcome to the CFL and TSN. I am your host for today <laughs> and tomorrow, but that's it. So fear not, Rod Smith will be back. I'm joined by Lapo and Schultz and Milt, and uh, we're excited to have the opportunity to talk some football with yes. you today on Saturday. Now, there are those who will say this game is meaningless. It may be meaningless in the standings, but I guarantee it is not meaningless to the players. Every football player has a reason to go out, strap it on, and get after it each and every game day, and this, this is no exception. Now, for the Bombers, their motivation may be slightly different from the Stampeders, mm -hmm. but I'm wondering, I know you guys have a difference of opinion. Drew, Drew Willie, starting a quarterback, we know from his head coach that he is going to play it by ear in terms of how much he plays. How mm -hmm. much would you play him? You know, I might play him the whole game because, you know, people saying it's not important or Drew Willie needs to develop, play the younger guys. I think that's ridiculous. You're trying to win a football game. You're trying to get your Drew Willie, who's a young quarterback, hasn't played a lot of football, guys. He's his first-year starter. The only way he's going to develop is by playing football games. He was sacked 10 times last week, held the ball milk. You know, I, he needs to play football. You, you, you talked about he was sacked 10 times last week. He's been sacked all year long. You watch enough film. You know what's going on. They don't have an offensive line to protect him. Why? Why are you putting your future in the line of fire like that to get hit some but more? But it's not always him. Sometimes it's uh, it's Drew Willie's fault for holding on the ball. Regardless, he's, he's getting hit. No, he's getting hit. On. He doesn't need to play this game at all. Sit him down. We're going to sit him down next week? Week next They're week, not week playing one? next week. <laughs> next year, week one? All right, all right. Let's get Schultz in here. Let's talk a little bit about Calgary. Yeah, we know that John Cornish and Mitchell want to play, too. Would you play them? Yeah, absolutely, positively. It's the 1st of November. The Great Cup is not until November the 30th. We're going to have this conversation about resting players or playing players. It is way, way, way too early. When they have that buy off, that week off, that's plenty of time to prepare mentally, physically, and get ready for the Great Cup. Play your players. John Cornish only needs 33 yards, guys, to hit 1,000. Remarkable accomplishment. Mm. Get it this game. Next game, different situation, but play them all. And the Calgary Stampeders, two wins away from tying the win total of 16, set by the Eskimos back in 1989. That's plenty of reason to want to get out there and get a win. Kickoff coming up next. Ken Manti of Steinbeck, Manitoba. You could win the ultimate $25,000 home theater package from Visions Electronics if a kickoff is returned for a touchdown today's game thanks to Safeway's touchdown to win promotion. And if a second kickoff is returned for a touchdown, you could win $1 million. Let's take you to McMahon Stadium where Gord Miller and Dwayne Ford have the call. Thank you, Jock. And the first day of November brings snow flurries to southern Alberta as the Calgary Stampeders will close out their regular season home schedule against the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. And the weather suggests playoff time here in the Canadian Football League, as does the return of John Cornish to this Calgary Stampeder lineup. They want to get their thoroughbred ready to rock. Used to these weather conditions, Cornish has been a monster against Winnipeg and quite frankly the rest of the league for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. The man charged with the task of making sure Cornish doesn't run wild, no pun intended here today. Their middle linebacker, Ian Wild, been one of the few bright spots for the Bombers this season. Winnipeg began the year with so much promise, five and one start, but now eight consecutive losses. They'll miss the playoffs for the third consecutive year, the fifth time in the last six. 
Canadian Football League seasons. And for John Huffnagel, there are records to play for down the stretch here. This game today and one more next week. Wins in both would equal the CFL record for wins in a season set by the 1989 Edmonton Eskimos, who went 16 and 2. Outstanding rookie season for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. We'll kick things off. And sends it down to the 15-yard line. And brought ahead by Cedric Cunningham. Gets out to about the 35. And as Bo Levi Mitchell brings the stamps on the field, the starters to watch are brought to you by Napa Auto Parts, where custom advice comes standard. Well, much has been said about the success of Bo Levi Mitchell as a starter in his young career. He brings a 15-1 record to the table here today. John Cornish, you look at his numbers in his last two against Winnipeg, going back to last season, earlier this season. He has been virtually unstoppable. You can't say enough about the offensive line led by the center, Brett Jones. Fewest sacks allowed in the league while also leading the Canadian Football League in rushing yards per game. And here's the first down carry to John Cornish, 23 yards away from 1,000. He gets about half those 23 necessaries. He picks up a gain of 12 and a Calgary first down. A bad sign for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers to start this game. They'll have some newer faces on that defensive line, meaning they'll rely on some of the guys in behind. Ian Wild in his last five games played. 44 tackles. He's been a busy man. Mo Leggett at free safety tied for third in the Canadian Football League with five picks. And Johnny Sears has settled in to that strong side linebacker spot. Had a big game in a loss last week against BC with a pick and a sack. And the give to Cornish again. He crosses the 50 close to midfield. And that'll be a gain of about five for Cornish, who has a chance to lead the league in rushing will play only 10 games at the most this season. And that would be the fewest games played to lead the league in rushing since the Canadian Football League went to a 16-game schedule. Yeah, and you saw the numbers off the top. Cornish averaging over 122 yards per game. The next closest player in terms of yards per game, John White and Edmonton at 91. So significant difference in terms of that game-to-game -game production. On second and five, here comes the blitz. Bo Levi Mitchell throws it out, and Mo Price has got the catch of first down and more. Inside the Bomber 45-yard line, he's brought down at the 41, and the gain is 17, another Calgary first down. Uh, Mo Price lines up in the slot on this one. He's just going to sit it down, and you'll see that putting could become an issue as this game goes on. It's a wet snow that's coming down to make the field a little bit slick. So as a defender, you've got to really concentrate on breaking down, coming in under control to make tackles so you don't end up with a flyby like you just saw. From the 41, the toss goes to Cornish around the left side. John Cornish busts through inside the 30. There's a 1,000 for John Cornish. Down the 24-yard line, and for the third consecutive year, Calgary's John Cornish has crossed over 1,000 yards rushing. And as great as John Cornish is, can't do it without a little help from his friends here. Watch the tackle. Stanley Bryant's going to drop and pull around. He's going to lead around the horn. Gets on his man, buries him to allow Cornish to turn it upfield. Cornish has a very good success against Winnipeg, 160 yards two weeks ago. The time before that, last season, a career-high 208 yards rushing against the Bombers. And back he comes on first down, busts inside the 10, and down to the nine yard line. As Cornish has another first down, a gain of 15, and now that he's crossed 1,000 yards, the question for Calgary will be, how much will he play this afternoon? Uh, let him play, John Cornish has been in and out of the lineup all year. Obviously, you want to keep him healthy, but as Chris Schultz alluded to in the, the pregame, you've got a bye week to recover, to, to get healthy from nagging injuries and those sorts of things. I think at the very least, you, you know, you definitely get into the second half here today, if not virtually the whole game here today. You worry about managing guys playing time next week. Now the play fake the Cornish, Bowley by Mitchell. Has lots of time, swings it out to Rob Corte. He's got a touchdown. And so just like that, the Calgary Stampeders take the ball to their opening drive. And 
open this game with a touchdown the fourth time this year that Calgary has scored a touchdown on its first possession of, this, of the football game. Uh, way too easy as you see Rob Cote play action slip out behind his offensive line into the flat. One of the unsung heroes of this Calgary Stampeder offense. The veteran fullback in for the touchdown. So with the exception of Bo Price's catch, that was all the backfield for the Calgary Stampeders. Cornish on the ground, and Cote catches the touchdown pass. So Cornish has got over 1,000, and the Calgary Stampeders look to equal a franchise record with their 15th win of the season. So a six-play, 74-yard opening game drive by the Calgary Stampeders. John Cornish carries the ball four times for 48 yards. And the Calgary Stampeders, quite frankly, made this look way too easy on their first drive of the game. There's no question what the game plan is going to be today. They're going to run the ball. They're going to put it in the hands of number nine. Very little resistance from the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. It all culminates in Rob Cote's first touchdown in 2014. Well, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers allow the most rushing yards per game in the Canadian Football League. And Calgary took advantage of that on the opening drive. Now the Bombers' first possession. And here is McGuffey on the kick return. Gets around the right side. And Sam McGuffey, one of the newcomers to the Winnipeg offense. We'll see Drew Willie and the Winnipeg offense go to work. And there's a flag on the return. Winnipeg has the bye next week, so this is the Bombers' final game of the season. Today's referee is Dave Foxcroft. Major foul, unnecessary roughness, Winnipeg, number 39. 15-yard penalty, it'll be a first down Winnipeg. So Michelle Pierre Palmbriol is called for unnecessary roughness. That'll move the ball back to the Calgary 20-yard line. Penalty after a decent return from Sam McGuffey. And a big team that desperately needs to try and recapture some early momentum in this ballgame. First down, Perry goes to Paris. Cotton slices through and cut out across the 30 to the 32 yard line. Gain of 12. As Winnipeg Blue Bombers look forward to next season, they believe they have found their running back. If the last two games are any indication, Paris Cotton, 239 yards rushing in his last two starts. Drew Willie has thrown the ball a ton this year. 300 plus yards in six games for him. Clarence Denmark, his favorite receiver, one of only two in the CFL with over a thousand. And Cotton gets stacked up quickly by the Calgary defense as. Brandon Jordan is among those in to make the stop along with Corey Mace. For the Calgary Stampeders, two of the most stable positions as they've gone through a lot of bodies defensively this season have been those halfback spots. Jamar Wald tied for the league lead with six picks this season. Brandon Smith second in the league in tackles. Sean Lemon picking up the slack for an injured Charleston Hughes. Ten sacks and leads the lead with six close from them. On second down, here comes the rush. Drew Willie gets away, throws for cut, and the pass is incomplete. As Juwan Simpson, the middle linebacker, was there on the coverage, and the Winnipeg Blue Bombers will have to punt. Uh, Drew Willie looking to try and settle in here. I mean, the big reason, as you heard the debate from the fellows in the studio, as to whether or not Drew Willie should be playing today. You want to finish on a positive note. You want to generate some momentum, a winning attitude. Everything else face challenges with this group of guys. Cedric Cunningham at the 30-yard line gets not much on a great special teams play made by Teague Sherman of the Bombers, and Calgary will have the ball back at its 31-yard line. John Cornish hasn't played a lot this year, but when he has, he has been outstanding. Stamps up 7 0 They pulled it nearly goal. Calgary number 27. CFL on TSN is brought to you by Nissan, official vehicle of the Canadian Football League. Calgary Stampeders have this home game to wrap up the regular season home schedule. Then, of course, they will play host to the West Division Final in three weeks' time and hope to advance the Great Cup indoors 
in Vancouver at the end of the month. First down carry goes to John Tortish. And the Vancouver native fights his way across the 25-yard line. And has a gain of about six. And here are the all-time single-season leaders in rushing yards per game. This year, John Tortish at 122 yards per game, surpassing Mike Pringle, 121 back in 1998. And there are other Calgary Stampeders there, including the great Willie Burt and Earl Lunsford back in 1961. Well, that just underscores how phenomenal, although abbreviated, John Cornish's season has been. Think back to 1998 and consider just how dominant Mike Pringle was at that stage of his career. How great Willie Burton was. And back when the run was much more of a feature of a CFL offense, in today's league, most teams throw the ball about procedure of the time. Calgary, least. number 65. Five yard penalty. Remains second down and also in the old days you weren't down until you were down They basically drove a stake in you <laughs> so you could run for five crawl for three and stagger for another couple more There's John Huffbengel looking on From the sidelines his message to the team was play well last year Calgary did not finish well in the regular season Wound up losing the West Division final at home. Yeah, don't think for a second that Getting 16 wins and a CFL record doesn't mean something to this group. Oh! On second down, the drop play to Cornish, and he gets up to the 30-yard line. He'll be a couple yards short of a Calgary first down. You see Kayshawn Fraser, one of the youngsters on this Winnipeg Blue Bomber defensive line. Jake Thomas, really the only regular starter in the lineup. Fraser has four starts this season joined as well on that D-line today by Marvin Booker, who's played a couple of games as well. Trey Harlan makes his CFL debut here today. So a young group up front trying to deal with John Cornish on the run. Harris Scott back to receive the punt from Rob Maber. And this is caught from the 30-yard line. Slippery track, flags are down as Cotton gets out to the 38-yard line. And this, by the way, for Calgary, the last chance to get a taste of outdoor football before playing host of the West Division Final. And John Humpnick will talk about the importance of, especially for players not used to it, getting used to the field conditions. And in general, the kind of conditions you'll face outdoors in Canada in November. Illegal block, Winnipeg, number 40. Ten-yard penalty, first down, Winnipeg. Another good return to gain it by a bomber penalty. So down seven to nothing. Drew Willie, the Blue Bombers. We'll have the football back. Trying to end the season on a high note after a great start and a very tough middle. So 27-year-old Drew Willie acquired by Winnipeg in the offseason from Saskatchewan. His first year as a starter in the Canadian Football League goes like this. Yeah, came out of the gates on fire. You see the first six, five and one record, 277 yards per game through the air. More touchdown passes than interceptions. And you see the reversal of fortunes in the second half of the season. As I think the reality of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers football team started to catch up to the middle of the They think that Harris Cup. And up to the 30-yard line is Rory Kohler, who is close to Winnipeg first down. So what did Drew Willie learn in his first year as a starter? I think I've learned a great deal this year. Um, I think you know people can tell you what to expect, but until you um, kind of experience it as a starter for that many games, it's hard to kind of you know what you know what other people are talking about. So uh, I'll definitely take everything I've learned this year and um, you know put it into my off-season plan and do everything I can to come back next year, you know, a better player. Fair to say the way that the Bombers weren't as good, maybe as their early season record, and perhaps not as bad as their late season record. Yeah, and then there were some games early on, as you suggest, that I don't want to say that they shouldn't have won because they won, them, so they deserve to win them, but some games which very easily could have gone differently in the first part of the season, and the record would have been would have been drastically different, but the record through those first six, that five and one, then also served the purpose of elevating expectations for a team that's still very much in rebuilding mode. It's going to take a couple of years to get this team to, to where they need it to be. I think they've got... I think they've got the right guy coaching. I think they've got the right guy right there calling the signals. They just need to continue to add some pieces around it and, and gain experience.
terms of those two key guys at head coach and quarterback. Second down, the draw play to Paris Cotton. Got away from the first man, and Cotton jumps up to the 40-yard line. And he'll be very close to another Winnipeg first down. The one thing Drew Willey has learned this year is what a lot of defensive linemen in the league look like. The Bombers have allowed a league-high 70 sacks this year, including 10 last week in the game against BC. By contrast, the Calgary Stampeders have allowed 24 sacks this season. Yeah, Drew Willey, and he missed one game, but Drew Willey has been sacked 66 times this season, more than any other quarterback in the Canadian Football League. And what it means as far as improvements, and again, you heard the, the boys in the studio talk about it. The offensive line needs to be better. Their run game certainly needs to be better. Drew Willey needs to gain experience in terms of his processing and getting rid of the ball more quickly. So there's a lot of work to come, but if Drew Willie is going to continue to be able to play 17 games a year for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, and by the way, the first Winnipeg quarterback to play that many games in a season since Kevin Glenn in 2007. But they got to do a better job of protecting. Mind you! And that is generally not a formula for success. The two things that kill drives, turnovers, obviously, and quarterbacks at. Yeah. yeah, and the turnovers have become an issue since that 5-1 and one start, as you saw. For Willie and in terms of ball security of the guys carrying the football. So Robert Barr ran for the first down. Willie's back in on the end of the round. They give it to DeMond Washington. And Washington, a defensive back, goes around the corner. A flag comes down at the end of the play. He got maybe a couple up to the 43 yard line. Different wrinkle for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Yeah, mixing it up a bit. Major foul, face mask, Calgary number 92. 15 yard penalty. Automatic first down. Yeah, we had an interesting chat with DeMond Washington. It was in Ottawa a few weeks ago, and he said the day before the game he had, he had been a running back and receiver in his high school college days. Felt very comfortable with the ball in his hands. And he said he'd love the opportunity to do this. He's one of those guys who said, just put me in, give me the ball, and let me go. I'll produce wherever you put me. And apparently after 17 games, they've decided to take him up on that offer. Bombers cross midfield for the first time in the Calgary 50. And Willie sets up the screen pass to Cotton. Not by the first man, Glenn Love, and gets down to the 46-yard line. Calgary's defense, by the way, in the last five games has allowed one first-quarter touchdown. Yeah, and a, a veteran group again as they've started to get some pieces back, still waiting on Charleston Hughes, as you see defensive coordinator Rich Stubler and certainly hope to have a healthy Hughes back for the playoffs. But as other players have gained some experience, it's been invaluable for this team. Corey Mace is a guy who came back from injury and has been good. Junior Turner, when he was in there, was very, very good at that defensive tackle spot. Linebackers have been consistent. On second down, Willie throws, and the pass is incomplete. Looking over the middle for Corey Watson. And so, on third and long, once again, Winnipeg will have to punt against a Calgary defense that does not lead the league in a lot of categories, but is still one of the CFL's best. Yeah, and it's, it's a matter of getting off the field is what you want. So you, you may not necessarily have guys making a ton of tackles when things are going well for you. But goes out of bounds, and the Calgary Stampeders continue to lead 7 0 here in quarter number one. The city of Calgary, and indeed the country, lost an all time great this weekend when John Forzani passed away of a heart attack. John on the left was one of the Calgary Stampeders co owners, a player for the team, along with his brothers Tom and Joe, went on to become a very successful businessman from one sporting goods store, Forzani Sports. Came Sport Check, one of the largest sporting goods retailers in the world. More than 500 locations across Canada. John was a community leader, a philanthropist, and a much beloved former Calgary Stampeder who passed away at the age of 67. And prior to this game, instead of a moment of silence, the Calgary Stampeders honored John with an ovation from this crowd, including the players. And it was a very solemn and very moving moment here at the Man Stadium. And John Huffnagel, who knew. John was any well as a friend and teammate was among those to lead the ovation. And the Calgary Stampeders, whose record of excellence speaks for itself, 
of the current ownership group. Now the ball their own 10 yard line. And the football comes loose, and the Bombers have it as Cornish has fumbled. And at the bottom of that pile, the Bombers have it. As it appears, though, Johnny Sears is the man who fell in the football to give Winnipeg an important turnover early here in the football game. Uh, a team desperately looking for any sign of momentum here to get things turned around. Their defense steps up. Big stick ball probably getting a little bit slick already. Results in this fumble. Johnny Sears and a guy who's productive last week in defeat. Was he down is the question. See as he goes falls backwards here so as soon as anything other than his feet or hands touch the turf he's considered down. I think he's down. I think he's down as well. So Cornish has not lost a fumble yet this year. The previous ruling of a fumble is under review by the command center. All turnovers and scoring plays are automatically reviewed and this has been one of the hallmarks of the Calgary Stampeders this year. In 10 of their games, Dwayne, they've had one or no turnovers. Yeah, and they, again, as we well know, this is one of the statistics that is the best predictor of the outcome of the game is that turnover battle, the giveaway takeaways. The Stampeders usually win it when your starting running back, John Cornish, has fumbled once in the games that he's played. Hasn't lost a fumble to date this season. It's significant. Ball was stripped out by Mo Leggett, the safety. It certainly appears as though, well, it's close. Yeah, it certainly looks closer from that angle than it did from the other side, as you can see the ball a little bit more clearly. Leggett's got his hand on it. And here is Dave Foxcroft with the results of the review. After review, there is insufficient evidence to overturn the call on the field. The ruling on the field stands. First down, Winnipeg. So there's the first fumble loss by John Cornish this season, and Winnipeg will have the ball first down at the Calgary 16-yard line. The Bombers, by the way, are trying to win in Ready Calgary team. in the regular yeah. season for the first time since 2002. You were still 20. 11 straight losses here in this stadium. First down from the 16. Here's Paris Cotton. And he runs into Calgary linebacker Duran Mayo gets a gain of maybe a couple. Yes, those were Milt Steagle's Blue Bombers <laughs> back in 2002. And overall, Calgary has won 10 straight against Winnipeg. The streak goes back to July of 2009. Throws to the end zone. It is incomplete. Clarence Denmark was the intended target. He got tangled up with Brandon Smith just inside the end zone. It'll bring up third down for the Bombers, and the field goal unit comes on. Uh, unable to capitalize in, in that territory, that offensive inconsistency that has plagued the Blue Bombers since their quick start to this season. And it's snowing harder here now as the afternoon progresses. Hyralahu out of the University of Western Ontario. Thank you. One guy who has been consistent for the Bombers this season. Should be the Bombers Rookie of the Year nominee, hitting on 87.8% of his field goal attempts. And the 21 yard line, and the field goal was good, so the Bombers have their first points of the game. Now down 7-3 with 126 to go in the first quarter. We spoke about John Forzani a moment ago, and John Huffnagle. Knew him for some 35 years. We asked John about his old friend. First of all, I was very saddened by it, uh, shocked, stunned. Uh, you know, John was a teammate of mine, uh, a good friend, one of the funniest guys that you can be around. One thing about John, even though he's no, no longer with us, you know, his legacy and his, his mark that he made in the sports world, in the business world, in the community of Calgary will always survive. Here's a look at the second Joe Forzani, John's nephew who played for Calgary. Three brothers played back in the 1970s, Tom, Joe, and John. And really were, when you talk about pillars of a community, the Forzanis really were and are that. 
uh, have meant so many things to not just the football community in Calgary, as you said, not just the business community, but the community as, as a whole. A big loss. John Forzani meant so too is a John Cornish. We worked hard and you know, like to have a lot of fun. And uh, you know, I, I think he's gonna be really missed by the Stampeders organization because he I think really kept the Stampeders as the Stampeders. You know, he no changes, but he, he molded it in the way that he thought would be uh, would be crucial to us continuing to be a successful program. And he's done so much for the city, so much for, for Canada even that uh, you know, he will be missed. Those words being echoed not just in this community, but across this province and across the country. First down, Stan Peters from their 49 yard line. Here is Cornish. And Cornish, likely not pleased after that fumble on the last possession, cuts down to the 46 yard line. Load effect blue bomber. Well, we'll see if he plays better when he's angry, if that's at all possible. Cornish, a good physical run here. Everything's clogged up in the middle. He's just going to keep the legs churning and plow through the pile. Before it, being brought down by Matt Buckner. Just last week's game against Saskatchewan with a leg injury. He's got 80 yards rushing already. He's making his career high in a single game. is 208 yards against Winnipeg last year. You've got to think with the, the number of games that John Cornish has missed this year and yeah he's been banged up a little bit at times but the, the very frightening thought of a relatively fresh john cornish heading into the playoffs has to be a concern for their western division rivals there's a game at 11 another calgary first down as we approach the end of the opening quarter you know last year in that loss to bc in the final week of the regular season the stampeders lost Mark Ivy McDaniel with a shoulder injury. He played in the West Final, but wasn't right. Lost two defensive linemen. So being healthy during the playoffs, another goal of the Stampeder. Yeah, I, I think it's big, but I also think a big part of that is continuing to play to win, but making sure you've got the depth to overcome. Now, Coach A has the touchdown catch here in the opening quarter. Takes that swing pass from Bo Levi Mitchell. The Stampeders are driving again as we reach the end of the first quarter. Calgary scoring its first possession of the football game. Looking at continuous dominance against the Blue Bombers here at home. The CFL on TSN is back after this. Back in Calgary, where Stampeder fans are hoping November is a championship month. Here are the numbers through the opening quarter of this football game. The Stampeders have 91 yards rushing on nine carries for 91 by John Cornish. And the turnover by the Stampeders allows Winnipeg to get three points in the football game. Calgary has already clinched first place in the West Division, knows it will play host to the West Division final in a few weeks, but this game still has meaning for Calgary? Yeah, this game has a ton of meaning for, for Calgary especially. This is a team that, even just within the regular season, wants to get that record. I, I truly believe that getting to that 16-2 and two mark, 16 wins, which would be a CFL record, equal to CFL record, I think it means something to this team to do that, and they don't want to let down at the end of the regular season at all. You're getting ready for the, the playoffs. You know you're going on to the postseason. You want to go in on a high note. This is your one opportunity before the Western Final to play in these kind of weather conditions and get used to them and figure out your footwear and, and, all, and all sorts of things. You've got still a number of young guys who may not have played in these kind of weather conditions that you want them to get used to it. So it's not a shock in the first playoff game. So there, there's a lot on the line in terms of the Calgary Stampeders trying to be successful over the last couple of weeks of this season. A win today would equal the franchise record of 15 wins in the season, which they've done three times in their history. And Drew Tate picked up the first down for the Stampeders now at the Winnipeg 24-yard line. Mitchell back in the shotgun. Has time and throws out to the flat. He's got Nick Lewis there. Inside the 20 to the 19-yard line. So. 
The CFL record for wins in a season is 16, set back in 1989 by Edmonton. Calgary's had 15 wins three times. The Eskimos in 89, Calgary in 93, 94, 95 did not win the Grey Cup. Calgary lost the West Final twice and the Grey Cup in 95. The other four teams, Baltimore in 95, Toronto in 96 and 97, and Montreal in 2009, all did win the Grey Cup after recording 15 win season. We'll point out that those three Calgary teams yes. and the two Toronto teams listed there were all quarterbacked by Doug Fee. And there's Cornish on the toss, but brought down quickly on a good defensive play by Winnipeg's Marvin Booker. And how many of those teams did you play on? None. None of those Calgary teams? None, None of those Calgary, Calgary teams. I, I, I was gone in the, the 15 win seasons. I was around for a couple of great cup years, though, so oh, I'll, I'll take that. I'll take that. It, now, I'll tell you, though, in 1995, I was actually playing in Toronto, going into the last week of the regular season, a miserable Toronto team, 3-14 and 14 going into the final week of the regular season, playing a 15-2 Calgary team that had a chance to equal that record. We ended up with an upset that left them in second spot on that list. Well done. Randy Paradise with a field goal has restored the seven-point lead for the Calgary Stampeders. Marvin Booker with a great open field tackle to limit the game by four. Still to come tonight, important game in the West Division as the BC Lions take on the Edmonton Eskimos. Edmonton wins clinches second place in the West Division and BC win those things wide open the race for second, third place. And that's a look north towards Edmonton as we hit November. Conditions change dramatically. Michael O'Shea and the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, the 2014 CFL season ends today. Uh, they're certainly looking to, to end, as you said, on a positive note. Eight consecutive losses coming into this one can with a real bad taste in your mouth. On Washington takes the kick off, gets around the corner, and up to the 42 yard line. Here's the tackle of the play. By the Stan Peters. Spencer Wilson. So Michael O'Shea was asked by us before this game, is it a meaningless contest? People would say that uh, they probably haven't stepped on the field when guys are trying to knock you down and, and, and take it out of you. Um, they haven't fed their family, you know, by, uh, by playing a pro sport. Um, they haven't fought for a job. So this is a lot of meaning for a lot of guys. As I said, I've, I've been in the situation, as I said, just before the break, 3-14 and 14 going into the final game. And you wonder a little bit. You find out about guys as to whether their bags are packed to go home the next day or whether they're more focused on playing and, and getting the job done. I'm sure that's part of the evaluation here today for Mike O'Shea. As he, he wants to know who's going to show up. And those that don't probably won't be invited back to training camp next, next summer. Corey Watson was offside. The pass falls incomplete. You know this because you played, but having been around professional athletes for a long time, there really are no meaningless games. There aren't. When you when you get paid to offside, play, Winnipeg number 81. That penalty's declined. Third down. Some games matter more than others, but every game matters. Yeah, there's absolutely no question about that. The guys who who ever take the the approach to a game thinking that it's meaningless don't last long. It doesn't matter what it's for. Anthony Parker back inside his 20-yard line. Hyralahu with a low end over end kick kind of dies at the 25. And Parker got by the first man. They gets stacked up again and finally gets cut down right where he started. Inside the 20. There's a flag on the play with 11.28 to go in the second quarter. After the punt, holding Calgary number eight. Ten yard penalty, first down Calgary. Don Time number out. with the tackle. And the Calgary Stan Peters with a seven point lead. A bowl lead by Mitchell from Katy, Texas. Back of the controls on the CFL on TSN.
On a snowy afternoon in Calgary, John Cornish has gone over a thousand yards rushing for the third consecutive season. Jermaine Franklin with more. Gord, despite the fact that John Cornish hasn't accrued the same amount of yards or numbers that he did in his MOP season last year, Cornish believes that he is still a better running back and that he's a much improved player. He points to his workload when he has the opportunity to be on the field, as is evidence. He averages 7.7 .7 yards per carry. Corners told me he can't control his injury situation. He couldn't control being concussed or a neck injury after he came off the IR. But obviously, he's made the most of his opportunities when on the field. He'll turn 30 on Wednesday. Seems to get better with age. I don't think there's uh, there's much doubt about that with uh, with John Cornish since taking over that starting running back role from Joffrey Reynolds a couple of seasons ago. And when you talk about the strength of the Calgary Stampeders, having a Canadian play such a pivotal role at a position that, for the most part, is performed by international slash American players, is a huge advantage for Calgary. Here he comes again, and Cornish busts across the 25 up to the 30-yard line. And Cornish slowly get to his feet here. Remember, suffered a leg injury, and Cornish is down. Well, hard to the turf, and we talked about concussion issues for Cornish early this season, and right away, the Calgary medical team comes out. Have a look at the star running back. It was a hard, hard fall of the turf. Well, it sure was. He landed with a jolt on that turf. A little bit of a bounce in the head and shoulder. You could see him having trouble as he tried to regain his balance, stabilize himself to get up. That's hard to watch. You see, watch the helmet as he lands. Cornish being led off the field to the Calgary sideline and you can't play football trying not to get hurt. It's not possible. Yeah, that's that's a guarantee that you will get injured. You saw Cornish in distress right away and now the Stampeders have the ball at their own 30 yard line but much more important things to worry about. And a hush falls over this Calgary crowd. Down carry goes to Matt Walter. And Walter has a first down up to the 42, a gain of 12. Here's a look at the Cornish injury. Right away, you can see he was in trouble. Well, you see the, the arms go straight, the body kind of goes stiff as soon as he lands. A bad sign you saw him first as he tried to get up. Tried to put his weight on his elbow, and that gave way, and then the legs were a little wobbly. Well, Walter gets wrapped up by Trey Harlan. So sixth 100-yard rushing game of the season for Cornish. He had 12 carries for 105. And Dr. Ian Ald in the two is talking with him, one of the top sports medicine doctors in the country and John Cornish is going to go to the Calgary locker room to appear. This afternoon is over and the Stampeders hope his season is not. Well, and th this game is John's, John Cornish's season in a nutshell. Incredible production but shortened by injury. Now Mitchell under pressure throws and the pass bounces off the knee of Walter. It'll bring up third down for the Stampeders. You see the bomber defender as well, slow to get up to losing his helmet. Yeah. Well, a smile for Cornish a little bit, so. Yeah, I'm not really buying the smile. Because I think he's got to be at least a little bit concerned at this point to have this happen at this stage of the season and frustrated with the way the season has gone. Neighbors kick bounces quiet. down to Cotton at the 20-yard line. Snow starting to accumulate on the field. And Cotton pushed out of bounds at the 23-yard line. As Beltre made the tackle, John Cornish. I think that was his mom he was waving to. Hoping he's okay with the stamps up by seven.
Back in Calgary, it's the broadcast premiere of the Hunger Games starring Oscar winner Jennifer Lawrence, Tuesday at 8, 7 Central on CTV. So a first down for the Bombers from their 23-yard line. It's been tough moving the football this afternoon and not going to get easy as the snow thickens here. You see that white sheet starting to cover and accumulate on the field. And on first down, play is called as Willie was about to throw. What was the coldest game you played in? And this isn't that cold, by the way, but... Offside, Calgary number 38. Five-yard penalty remains first down. Although Dave Foxtrot does appear to be in a ticker tape parade. <laughs> yes, he may he may disagree. It's not cold up here. No. No, I, I would say that the coldest that I can remember, uh, maybe the 97 West Semi here at McMahon Stadium against the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. I remember my hands getting pretty cold over the course of that one. Now, coldest day, coldest game that I've been involved in. I didn't dress for the 91 Grey Cup <laughs> in Winnipeg with the Stampeders. Bridget. Here's Sam McGuffey on the carry, and McGuffey gets across the 40 up to the 43. Good for a Winnipeg first down and a gain of 15. I did the sidelines in that game for ESPN. That was as cold as I've ever been outdoors. Yeah, I, I always describe it as the, the coldest day that I've ever stood outside for three hours. Of course, at, uh, at that time, they had the propane heaters, the big propane heaters on the sidelines, but they shut them off at halftime. Why? Well, because the guys who were playing in the game had gone into the dressing room. Oh, so but those of us who weren't dressed, we were, we were told to wait outside, so, yeah, it was a touch turn. Now Willie throws, and Kohler's got the catch, oh! off the football, and Kohler bounces back on him right at the line of scrimmage. So who was the sadistic coach that wouldn't allow the non-dressed players to go in the in the locker room. That guy didn't last long, did he? <laughs> well, he, he won more games than anybody in this oh, league, so. it was Wally Boyle. Yeah, so he's, I think he knew what he was doing. Wally's charm offensive continued. <laughs> so he had to stand outside at halftime. Yeah, th those who weren't dressed stayed outside at halftime. Didn't want to be a distraction. I'm okay with it. You're over it now. I'm over it now. Second and long now for the Bombers. Six and a half to go in the second quarter. Someone up the field, dives out of bounds, right in front of the Calgary bench. Then Jay Shell had him lined up, and Willie just avoided him. Yeah, you can see Willie doing a little bit of that shuffle to slow down as he got towards the sidelines. A real indication of what the players are dealing with in terms of the footing down there. Change of direction is not going to be easy. down by Team Sherman. So what was John Huffnagel's message to his team prior to this game? You know how to win football games? The recipe doesn't change. Okay? Take advantage of playing in adverse weather conditions. Okay? Take advantage of it. Next week we're inside. This is our only opportunity to play in weather that could be similar to the way we're going to be, to the weather we're going to have in the Western Final. And there's an idea of what you might face in three weeks' time when you play host to that game, which has tripped Calgary up over the years a time or two. And now Walter on the first down carry. Cuts across the 40. Gets back to Mon Washington. And Walter pushed out of bounds at the Winnipeg 43-yard line. A run of 41 yards for Matt Walter, who has subbed in ably for John Cornish before this season. Yeah, Matt Walter comes into this game. 66 carries, 344 yards on the ground. Hometown guys grown up playing some pretty meaningful football on this field as a former University of Calgary Dino. They're in action today against the University of Manitoba. Yeah, keeping that Calgary-Winnipeg rivalry alive on all levels today. 
Blake Mill runs the exceptional Calgary Dinosaurs football program. And here's Walter again as he gets across the 45 to about the 43. Pretty good tradition of running backs in that Dinos program. You mentioned Matt Walter. We've seen guys in the CFL, Stephen Labala and in Montreal, Anthony Woodson with the Toronto Argonauts this season. Anthony Parker here with the Stampeders, also a UFC graduate. There are more than a dozen of them playing in various spots around Seven the Canadian minutes. Football League. Yeah, pretty good run. Blake, Blake Mills got the factory going here in Southern Alberta. Now on second and long, Mitchell throws underneath. And the pass is caught by Mo Price, and Price has a first down, a gain of 14 as he slides down to the Winnipeg 29-yard line. Well, Bo Levi Mitchell gets rid of this ball under a little bit of pressure. The blitz, the loop for me and Wild, he comes free. Mitchell stands in to make that throw to Price. Again, you see the defender, Washington, excuse me, Buckner, having a little bit of trouble. Now one little change of direction from the receiver. Presenting a problem for the DBs. Direct snap, and Walter gets wrapped up right away as Trey Harlan sniffed that out. And it'll be a loss of a couple on the play. That's a favorite to John Cornish we've seen over the years, the direct snap. Yeah, it goes back in this Calgary Stampeder offense a long way, just allows that running back to get the ball a split second sooner and aids in the, the misdirection of the quarterback who's going the other way on the bootleg. So what comes out of the playbook on days like this? <laughs> the deep ball, probably? Well, it's it's going to become a little bit tougher to, to throw the deep ball. You may want to still take some of those opportunities, but include your, your double move type routes. Because as we said, the, the DBs are going to have trouble reacting to, to some of those kinds of things. I mean, basically, though, you, you just want to play straight ahead football. Straight ahead physical football and not require your players to be changing directions a great deal. Walter got seven on the play, but is well short of a Calgary first down, so the field goal unit will come on. And Paradise will try this from 32 yards out. A 32 yard field goal attempt. Nice snap. Tate gets it down and it hits the upright. Been that kind of year for any Paradise. And Calgary gets nothing. Continues to lead by seven as we reach the three minute warning here at McMahon Stadium. The CFL on TSN returns in just a moment. Back in Calgary, where someone stole downtown, we would be unaware of it. It is a snowy day coming up from the warmth of the studio CFL Live at the half with Jock Climbie, your host, Bill Stegall, Paul Apolise, and Chris Schultz. Ah, this is football, my friend. This is uh, playoff weather. You love this kind of weather, didn't you? Well, this brought the other players down to my speed. So, yeah, I appreciate it. From the 25-yard line, Harris Cotton. Cotton out across the 30-yard line, and you have something, Dwayne, you'd like to say. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what. I'm glad that Milt Stiegel is in the studio today. A couple weeks ago, Milt Stiegel threw a flag on me and my usual partner, Rod Black, for our dancing. And I hope that he doesn't do the same today. In fact, here's what I hope to see from Milt at halftime today. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z. Now I know my A, B, C, don't you come and play with me. Oh, my. Blackmail footage surfaces. Three, four, open the door, five, six, six, pick up the sticks, seven, eight, it's too late. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. A man of many talents, or not, <laughs> Milt Stiegel. How long have you been sitting on that? A while. A while. Who else do you have stuff on? Everybody. Oh, no. Oh, no. Everybody that ever appears on air at TSN. I trust that that will be the last flag thrown on me from anybody on that panel. On first down from the 35, Willie fires it out. And a big hit there by Fred 
Bennett as the catch was made by Romney Bryant, the former Calgary Stampeders, and Calgary Stampeder rather, and Fred Bennett comes up with a big stick. Defensive players like days like today, don't they? I'll tell you what, the, the hits hurt a little bit more as, as it starts getting chilly. I, I will say that. This will sting a bit for Romney Bryant. Perfect form tackle there from Fred Bennett. This is no longer a light dusting. And this is Paris Cotton versus Traxxas. It's up to the 50 yard line. So we have not yet had a report from the Stampeders on the condition of John Cornish. It's unlikely they're going to give us any kind of significant update today or given John Huffnagel's reticence to disclose things anytime soon. Of course, Huffnagel coached with Bill Belichick in New England. <laughs> where, what do you imply? Where course? the time of day is a guarded secret. And there's Cotton again. And he gets a gain of a couple up to midfield. Uh, and you never want to speculate on the, the nature or extent of an injury, but it seemed pretty apparent a head injury for John Cornish. And so there's going to be some uncertainty, uh, as we know, with with head injuries, concussions, if you will, then you, you never really know what the timeline's going to be. He came back against Ottawa and, and told us that week about how it was as much of a neck issue for him as it was the concussion. And the two things are related. Now, Willie up and throwing, and the pass for Corey Watson falls incomplete. That'll bring up third down. For the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, down by seven with one to go in the second quarter. And this one looked early on. You, you wondered a little bit what you were going to get from the Winnipeg Blue Bombers from a competitive point of view. As we saw John Cornish basically knife through the defense on that, that first drive. I think the Bombers have battled and have competed in this football game, but as they have for much of the second half of the season just struggled with their execution. Here's Parker inside the five-yard line. It was a good kick by Harold The Two bombers collided, and Parker goes right by them. Anthony Parker with a flag down. It's out to the 46-yard line. And so a great return by Parker may be negated by a Calgary penalty. And here's Dave Foxcroft. With the call. During the return, holding Calgary number 24. Ten yard penalty, first down Calgary. McDougal questioning the call. As Peter McDougal was flagged, number 24. Well, hold aside. Anthony Parker has been a threat in this return game. Throughout a guy who may be auditioning a little bit. So you see. Keaton McDougal, who was flagged for the hold. Special teams coordinator Mark Killam there. And now holding by Mitchell. Hands off to Walter. And he's tripped up after not much of a game. Stopped made by Jake Thomas. The Bombers are auditioning a number of players this afternoon, especially along the defensive line. Where of their four starters, three are in their first year in the Canadian Football League. A couple of them are in their first couple of games in the league. Yeah, Jake Thomas suddenly finds himself as the third-year man, as the senior individual on that offensive line. Thomas on the right, number 95. And it must be cold. O'Shea's not wearing shorts. Mitchell to Mo Price, who gathers that up. And Lost the football, it's going back the other way. John Lee Sears has it. And he gets pushed out of bounds by Stanley Bryant, but another turnover by the Calgary Stan Peters in their half of the football field. Sets the Bombers up. First and goal for the seven-yard line with 14 seconds to go in the first half. And John Hopnagel, we talked about ball security prior to the game. Well, I was going to say that was the other part of the pregame speech that, uh, that we didn't see was the importance in these weather conditions of taking care of the football. They not only put it on the ground a couple times, but think about the field position where they put it on the ground. And in this situation, the time. 14 seconds left in the half, leaving your own territory. You can talk all you want about the injuries 
have hurt Calvary late last year. The fact was they turned the ball over seven times that West Final loss last year to Saskatchewan. Absolutely. So a chance now for the Bombers late in the first half. Drew Willie, four for eight, 23 yards passing so far on this blizzard. to the end zone and it is incomplete as he was looking down there to Clarence Denmark but the pass drew him past the end line now second and goal eight seconds to go yeah, and I think if they manage this properly they should have enough, enough time to take another shot at the end zone here and still then if they don't get it be able to line up and take try to kick the field goal Side, Sean Lemon sets a new Stampeder record if this stands as a fumble with this would be his seventh forced fumble of the season. See if he gets this before Willie's arm starts forward. Ooh, to me, his arm's down and back, not moving forward yet when the ball's knocked in. I think the forward motion starts after the ball is tapped out of there. That's a tough call. Jake Ireland is the or the replay official. And if, if you had insufficient evidence on what was ruled a fumble by John Cornish earlier to overturn it, I... Fumble stands. Now, there's some confusion on the field here. Michael Shea appears to have thrown the challenge flag. Now, did he do it before the play was run? Now, but again, if it was ruled reviewed, a fumble, right. it's been reviewed, and we, we yeah. saw this in Ottawa last week where... Right. They wanted a review, essentially a review of the, the previous review. play was already reviewed. We will there will be two seconds left. Two seconds. First down Calgary. So it's been ruled that it was a fumble. And so the play does not count because O'Shea threw the challenge flag. Although that's technically, I think, an illegal challenge. And yeah, if you basically what, what we determined after going through this situation in Ottawa last week is you need to find something else on the play to challenge right. to force them to look at it again right as opposed to challenging the challenge or challenging the review process and if that next review reveals something else that causes the turnover ruling to be overturned so be it and so, Bolivar Mitchell takes a knee, and the Calgary Stampeders have the lead. They lose their star running back in the first half. There's lots to talk about coming up at the half. Thanks very much, Gord. Back in studio here with Chris Lapo and Milt. Interesting first half, uh, obviously. The snow's coming down, slippery conditions, often dangerous conditions. But before we talk about the football game, I've got to get some more information, Milt, oh, on what God. that nonsense was with you and the banjo and the dancing and the shirt off. I mean, I'm used to Dunnigan <laughs> stripping down, but what was that? What's this? Well, well first of all, somebody in Winnipeg is going to pay. Because that footage was supposed to be destroyed. No, don't play in the footage, no, Milt. No. That, that was just a little antics I did before the banjo bow in, in 07. Why aren't you wearing a shirt? I have on a dark shirt. It's a dark shirt. <laughs> He's Dwayne, this is not over, Dwayne. <laughs> this is the first time I've ever seen somebody flex while playing the banjo <laughs> topless. This is not over, Dwayne. Okay. I guarantee thankfully, you. Thankfully, we can leave that behind us. Guys, let's talk about what we saw there in the first half. John Cornish had 100, over 100 yards rushing in, on just 12 carries. He was his normal dominant self. Mm -hmm. We had a discussion before 
the game about whether or not you play your starters in a game like this for both teams. And, and Milt, I asked you about John Cornish in particular. Now, we don't want to speculate as to what his injury is, but we know he had concussion problems earlier in the season. He seems to land on his head and seems to get up woozy. Guys, does this inform the debate? Does this change how you see this issue when you see a guy, a star like this, get hurt in this situation, Lapo? Yeah, you know, I, I think we'd all love to have that crystal ball to be able to say what he Back in Calgary, where halftime was a chance to make the field look like a gridiron again. They got that dusted off with Calgary leading 10-3. One of the big stories about running back John Cornish. Head coach John Huffnagel of Calgary spoke with our Jermaine Franklin. Coach, injuries are always a concern in every game. Can you talk a little? Do you have an update on John Cornish? Uh, he got dinged a little bit. Uh, it's not as serious as the first one, uh, but uh, he'll be going through the concussion protocol. Can you talk about dealing with these elements, and are there any thoughts of resting players in the second half? No, we're trying to win the football game. I don't have enough guys to rest, okay? Everyone's playing. So, uh, yeah, we'll do, do our best to try to win this game uh, and then move on. Thanks for this. Okay. So a chance for the Calgary Stampeders to win their 15th game of the year, which would tie a franchise record set in 93, 94, and 95. And a win today at home against Winnipeg and then next week in Vancouver would tie the single season record of 16 and 2. And there is John Cornish on the sidelines. That's an encouraging sign for Calgary that he's not in the locker room. Yeah, absolutely. And as you heard John Huffnagel say, he's being observed going through the protocol, but obviously wants to be out here, not just supporting his teammates, but I think also wants his teammates to feel like he's okay. These players might want to enjoy the yard lines and hash marks while they last, which doesn't look like it's going to be long. As Paradise sends that kickoff high to McGuffey at the 25-yard line. And McGuffey picks his way ahead out to the 40, which is where the Blue Bombers will start. Bombers will look to try and get things going right away here. Want to see an aggressive approach. Now we're going to see Robert Marv in a quarterback for the Bombers here in the second half. So Marv, who saw his only playing action of the season two weeks ago in the home loss by the Blue Bombers to Calgary. That was the game that clinched first place in the West Division for the Stampeders. He comes on to start the second half for Winnipeg. Takes the high snap and hands off to Paris Cotton. And Cotton was tripped up right away. As DeQuinn Evans got a hand on him. On Robert Marv. Limited to, to short yardage duty. For most of the season, but as you said, got, got to run the regular offense, so to speak, when he came on in relief of an injured Brian Brom. Guy, five year old native of Tampa, Florida, which might seem like it's on another <laughs> planet right now. Yeah, started his college career at the University of Miami before transferring to Purdue. On second down, Marv pulls the ball down and gets dragged down by Deron Mayo well short of a Winnipeg first down. Well, and Marv's running ability, a big part of what he brings to the table in contrast from the guys who have been ahead of him on the depth chart, Willie and Braun. To this point, you may see the play calling change up a little bit here with Robert Marv in the ball game to try and move that pocket around a little bit, a little more play action bootleg type stuff, which provides him with an opportunity to run the ball. Who bounced that down to Parker at the 20-yard line. And Parker steps out of bounds after a return of five. So Bo Levi Mitchell comes back to work for the Calgary Stampeders. Starting his 14th game of the year for the Stamps. He missed three to injury. A relatively quick recovery was that Toronto game. Here where enough number of the Stamp injuries occurred with both Mitchell, Charleston Hughes going down in that one. As well as Markway McDaniel remains on the six game injured list. That's former Stampeder Chris Randall, I believe. Yeah. The injured bomber. Playback on first down, Mitchell throws and Look out, falls over the 
the sideline signage is Kamar Jordan, whose first CFL catch will be a memorable one as it includes a little high jump action. And he gets a gain of about seven on the play. Oh! Low marks from the Russian judge on that vault, I'd say. Jordan, another big receiver in this lineup. Played at Bowling Green University. Six foot three, 205 pound receiver. Now Walter with a flag down, gets across the 35 yard line, which would be good for a Calgary first down. It's a holding call though against the Stampeders. This will come back. Repeat, second down. You've got your, uh, not purple, it's a uh, garnet tie on today. Is that garnet you're wearing? What, what color does uh, it's purple to me? Purple to you? Okay, not garnet. Uh, your University of Western Ontario Mustangs. Winners in OUA playoff action today against Laurier, 25 to 10. All is well with the world. <laughs> Your world, I guess. Which is the only world that matters. Well, all, all is well with the CIS world. There you go. So, so university football playoffs beginning in some parts of the country. So the penalty now makes it second and 13, Calgary. Mitchell throws. Here's the first catch by Joe West this afternoon. And West gets maybe three on the play back to the original line of scrimmage. That'll bring up third down for the Stampeders. How concerned should the Stamps be that essentially their starting offense, minus Cornish with the first half injury, has not done much here in this football game against a team that will not make the playoffs? Well, it's absolutely a worry because it's not the way that, that you want to come out. Now, with Cornish in the lineup, they came out and they, they ran the ball right down the Blue Bombers' throats and at will, basically, to start. Maver has that check block. And a chance now for the Bombers to recover the ball at the three-yard line. So another turnover by the Calgary Stampeders deep in their own end. Looks like Corey Watson got the hand on that. And the Bombers are in business. Uh, trouble on the back end of this punt unit for the Calgary Stampeders is they've got four guys across that back line and they're responsible for taking what comes through. You'll see they're not outnumbered. Winnipeg Blue Bombers get one, two, three, four guys through for four blockers. Their issue comes when they take three guys to block two on the right side. Yannick Carter went right when he's got to stay on the left with Jeff Heck. He should have had Corey Watson. 16th block kick of the year in the CFL. Only 10 all of last year. Here's Cotton with the first down carry. And Juwan Simpson gets a quick hand on him. And if anything, a loss of a yard for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. And for the third time in this game, Dwayne are set up deep in Calgary territory. Yeah, the block punt, much like the turnovers in that first half, very timely in terms of the field position, but it's a matter of capitalizing. Here you see terrific defensive play by Juwan Simpson just shooting that gap to run down the back caught in the backfield. Now on second down, Drew Willie throws to the goal line and is caught for a touchdown. Clarence Denmark has the first touchdown of the game for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers and now the point after can tie it. Bombers finally take advantage, and there's the guy who set it up, Corey Watson. His second blocked punt of the year sets the table for the Bomber offense. Been a big part of the CFL story this season. We mentioned 16 so far, and a number of them have played deciding roles in football games. Drew Willie. Gets it to Denmark, who has his first 1,000-yard receiving season this year. Now has his third touchdown catch of the season. Check that, Robert. It was Robert Marr. Pardon me, not Drew Willie. And now Hiralahu with the point after to tie it. And a low snap, and the whole misfires. And now it's punted into the end zone by the holder, who is Kyle Jones. 
Okay, if he managed to bounce this for the drop kick. The convert is no good. He did not, apparently. So, the Stampeders maintain the lead. Watson the block, Denmark the catch, and it's 10 to 9. Jacksonville, Florida, he was able to find the end zone. Literally, he looked down for the yellow stripe to see if he was in the end zone or not. He has the touchdown catch, and his team with the missed convert is now within one. And Clarence Denmark, another one of those positives in a rough year for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, over a thousand yards receiving for him this season. And now, with the football back on first down. Here he goes to Anthony Parker. Here you see where it began. Corey Watson right up the middle. Free run to make the block. He's happy over there on the sidelines. And Marv with a touchdown ball. catch to Denmark, who was telling teammates during the timeout, I had to make sure where the yellow stripe was. I wasn't sure. Yeah, they're, they're all becoming blurred quickly down there, despite having been shoveled off in the break. Now Bully by Mitchell looking over the top, and the pass is incomplete. That's the first time we've seen either quarterback try a deep throw that was incomplete for Mo Price. And the, the deep passing game has really not been, been a factor. Under these weather conditions, Mo Price Starts as the number three receiver into that boundary. Well, that's the great equalizer, isn't it, Dwayne? When you think about, you know, the 89 Edmonton Eskimos who went 16 and 2. It was a ferociously cold day at Commonwealth Stadium in Edmonton when they lost the West Final of Saskatchewan. Let's go, Mo, come on! The fumble recovered for a touchdown in that game was really the deciding factor there. You gotta think that with conditions like this, in three weeks' time. Now, ugly weather can change everything, whether it's just a, a really wet day that makes the ball slippery, makes it feel slushy, whatever it may be. Or when it gets cold like this, and the, the combination of the footing, the, the effect on ball security, as we've seen a couple of times, the Stampeders, a team that has taken care of the ball all year putting it on the ground a couple of times in the first half. Here's Walter now on the first down carry, and now Walter Busser's still going. And down the 40-yard line. Money brought down by Matt Butner, a gain of 19. And you see the burst from Matt Walter, and while Matt Walter may not be John Cornish, he's a guy who actually may have more straightaway speed than Cornish given the opportunity. The other test on a day like this is who's wearing sleeves and who isn't. <laughs> By the way, Mo Price from Orlando, Florida is not. Now Mitchell wanted to go over the top, goes underneath instead, it skips off the hands of the newcomer, Kamar Jordan, who had a catch earlier in the half. I wonder if a part of this, tough to say whether it becomes a visibility thing with the snow or just a feel for the ball. His hands get cold, tough to say, but I mean, regardless, this is something Kamar Jordan, if, he's, if you're going to play in the Canadian Football League late into the season, these are things you've got to adjust to and be able to make that play. Second down, Mitchell has all kinds of time. They chase down, a flag comes down. And there was no Calgary receiver anywhere near that. And it looks as though the call is going against Calgary. Calgary number 65. That penalty's declined. Third down. So again, the Stampeder drive stalls. And Peter Kyle. Another of those former dinos. Yeah, even with Medicine Hat, Alberta. Always the challenges. Quarterback 
you get a broken play and the quarterback is on the move. Tough for the offensive line to really know what their angles are in terms of blocking position. So rather than try a 47-yard field goal, Maver and the punting unit come on, and Maver was aiming for the sidelines but misses. And Paris Cotton will take a knee, and the Calgary Stampeders are now up by two. 11-9 the score. 7-26 to go in the third quarter. The CFL on TSN is back after this. The sack tally is brought to you by Purelater, tackling hunger across Canada. Check. Winnipeg is second last in the league with 41 sacks. Calgary at 45. The Saskatchewan Rough Riders, who are dropping quarterbacks at will, lead the league with 61. You get a look at one of the best in the Canadian Football League, and Sean Lemon has got 10 on the year. Bomber started their own 35 yard line. March stays in, throws to Watson, who lost the football, and the rule that an incomplete pass. By the way, the virtual first down line is not working anymore. Another victim of the uh, elements, so we apologize for that. And the actual first down lines <laughs> are only slightly yeah, better. It's a bit of an issue itself. This is a, a heavy, wet snow today. factor is the black shoot up rubber that they use on field turf to keep the turf soft is trying to mix it with the snow and make it miserable for the players but this is a Procedure. much better option Winnipeg number 61 five yard penalty remains second down than the old AstroTurf which was hard as concrete in the summer and worse in the winter yeah absolutely absolutely a good surface to play on I mean anything anything in these weather conditions is is going to have its issues there's what I'm talking about. Field turf has the blades of green fake grass, fake grass. and then mixed in is ground up rubber in the form of black pebble. Amar gets fucked out of the pocket, looking up the field. We'll try it there, and the pass is incomplete for Clarence Denmark. And back on the coverage with Josh Bell, the safety for the Stampeders along with Buddy Jackson, the corner. But as Robert Marv continues here at quarterback, I'm a little bit surprised that we didn't see Drew Willie into the third quarter. I mean, we knew that, that Robert Marv was going to get a chance to play. We anticipate that we may see Josh Portis as well as part of your evaluation process, decide who's going to be part of, part of the mix next season and who's not. You want to see guys play in game situations. Marvin takes the punt the 35-yard line, spins away from one. And he gets brought down at the 48. Ian Wild among those to make the tackle for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. So the Calgary offense will go back on the field. And we'll see more of 25-year-old Matt Walter, the Calgary native, who has replaced John Cornish at the tailback position for the Stampeders. Yeah, Matt Walter, 2011 draft choice of these Calgary Stampeders. Turned to school for his final season after he was drafted to complete his degree. Joined the Stamps in 2012 as the primary backup to Cornish. And the gift goes to Walter, gets around the corner and gets cut down by DeMond Washington. And there's a flag down. Holding, Calgary number 85. 10-yard penalty, repeat, first down. So again, a penalty wipes out a significant play by the Stampeder. You're going to see more holding, though, Dwayne, when players are having trouble with their footing. Yeah, absolutely. West right in the middle of your screen. Number two receiver. Too late to avoid being flagged, particularly when you're right at the point of attack. As John Cornish looks on. So now it's first and 20 from the 39. The draw play to Walter. And he's tripped up. And as reaching to get him was Mo Leggett, the safety. 
leg. It eventually brings him down. Looked like this play had a shot, but somebody got a hand on Cornish, one of the defensive linemen. Got a piece of him right at the line of scrimmage. Got a gain of eight in the play. You'll see once he takes the handoff. The D tackle Harlan. They got a piece of him and slowed him down, allowing Leggett to close and make the play. <laughs> On second and 12, Mitchell throws the sideline, knocked down by Washington as he stepped in front of Anthony Parker, and Calgary will again have to punt. Yeah, nice break to the football, particularly considering the field conditions from DeMond Washington. So one team has won 10 of its last 11. The other has lost eight straight, but this afternoon, the weather is the great equalizer. This is why, you, in all honesty, if you're a team like the Calgary Stampeders, knowing that you're going to be playing right back on this field a couple of weeks from now, that this sort of weather could exist at that time. You, you want an opportunity to play in it before then. Keenan McDougal makes a terrific special team stop for the Calgary Stampeders, who still lead by two with 4.24 to go in the third quarter on the CFL on TSA. Calgary, where after every TV timeout, they shovel the yard lines and the hash marks to give the players some idea of where they are on the football field. And we'll take a look at one of the guys who seems to be thriving in the conditions. Keenan McDougal, third year man out of the University of Saskatchewan. Key special teamer for the Stampeders came into this game with 15 special teams tackles. Made a nice transition this year to bulking up, moving from this free safety spot from a backup linebacker for the Stamps. Tremendous, tremendous athlete, Keenan McDougal. So now the Bombers have the football just inside the 25-yard line. They've been gifted with three excellent chances deep in Calgary territory. Two turnovers and a block kick. A touchdown in the field goal to show for and The first down carry. Goes to Cameron Marshall, making his CFL debut this afternoon. The first year man out of Arizona State, out of San Jose, California. So the auditions continue. Yeah, this is the, the bar. Third, third international running back we've seen in the Bomber backfield, joining Paris Cotton, of course, who started, and Sam McGuffey. Had a carry a little bit earlier. Expected to see Marshall mostly on special teams here today, but the Bombers decided take a look at him with the ball as well. Now the fake to Paris Mark. Mark got buried. There's a flag down. The pass was incomplete for Darrell Jackson. Now coverage there by Fred Bennett. We have a, we have a roughing the passer penalty. Major foul. Calgary. Roughing the passer. Calgary number 25. 15-yard penalty. Automatic first down. So Keon Raymond is called for roughing the passer. And the Bombers get a first down on him. Back at this hit and see the timing. Keon Raymond is going to come on the blitz. The bottom of your screen, bottom end of that line. And that's due to the headshot. Ten penalties for 90 yards for the Stan Peters as the Bombers are now at their own 50 yard line. Mark gives up the Paris Cotton and Patton. Across that field and down to the Calgary 46 yard line. He's got a gain of 13 yards and another Winnipeg first down. And the Bombers, with the help of that penalty, are putting together the most important, impressive drive of the football game. Yeah, this is what impresses me about Paris Cotton is that acceleration. Real burst to his game, quickness through that hole. He got straightened up by Quinn Smith. Now the mark that is a gain of a yard. There you see the numbers on Paris Cotton. 
his last two games since becoming the Bombers starting running back 239 yards average eight yards a carry in those two games so first Winnipeg running back the most back-to-back 100 -back yard game since Fred Reed back in 2010 on the quarterback drive. He's got a first down or shot as he dives inside the 40-yard line. Marked down the 37. And that should be enough as the gain is eight. Play calling. Again, changing depending on which quarterback is in the game. This is a strength for Marv. Very comfortable taking off with the ball in his hands. Stuck there by Jeff Jack for safety. At the end of that play, Marv was a little bit slow getting up. It is a first down for the Bombers, though. At the 37 yard line. Here's Compton again. A little second effort gets down to the 35 yard on a gain of two. Cotton out of Central Michigan. Not the biggest guy at five foot eight, but pretty sturdy, 195 pound. He got a, a feel for that on that last run. It looked like he was stopped in the backfield, but a little bit of weight, a little bit of power. Keep the pile moving forward. Under a minute to go in the third quarter, and the Bombers are moving. They're now facing second and eight. is knocked away by Buddy Jackson. Almost had a chance to take that back the other way. It brings up third down now for the Bombers. And it appears, though, Hiralahu will try a field goal. Buddy Jackson, as usual, the outside that boundary corner. Great jump to the football. Well, Jackson was the intended target, so... Hiralahu in difficult conditions will try the field goal. He's had a good year, as you mentioned. He's 11 of 13 from outside the 40-yard line. This will be a 42-yard attempt. Not much win. Jones the holder. Lower snap. And it's blocked. A line drive field goal. So hang on a second. And some of the centimeters making snow angels after the block. Why not? But hang on. What's this penalty about? Flag after down. the play, unnecessary roughness. Calgary, number 36. 50 yard penalty. It'll be a first down, Calgary. So it'll come after the block, and the stamps will be moved back. As Love was flagged, the special teams player of the week last week. But another block kick. This one might be less of a block than it is a misfire. It looked like Kyle Jones got it down, but longer field goal is going to have a lower trajectory to get that distance. Keep an eye on the far right side of your screen. Quinn Evans that delivered the block. Yeah, not a lot. Love. Love was playing. Now on first down, Mitchell up and throwing. It's complete to West. And very carefully, West is tackled there by Chris Randall because there was no one behind him. Randall doing a good job on his former teammate. Wrap him up and hang on. Well, there's a palm tree of sorts here this afternoon. <laughs> Inflatable tide. They don't count. 11-9, Calgary with the lead as, under tough conditions, the Calgary Stampeders have run the record of 15-2 on the season. There's the pictures and there's the numbers after three quarters here in Calgary. So. 14 first downs for the Stampeders to 12 for Winnipeg, but the big story here, three turnovers by the Stampeders have kept Winnipeg in the football game through three quarters of play. Gordon Miller and Dwayne Ford back here in Calgary. Look, the Stampeders have 14 wins on the year. They've been the most impressive team in the CFL from start to finish. How much concern should there be about today? Well, there, there's concern about 
their inability, I think, to adapt to the conditions. You've got a team that, through this season, a lot of their success has had to do with taking care of the football, not giving up opportunities like the three they've given up today with two fumbles and a blocked kick, all deep in their own opportunity, or all deep in their own territory. That to be a championship team, you can't make those mistakes and you can't let the conditions become this much of a factor. And so I think that's where your greatest frustration is. This is caught by Mo Price, who gets up to the 50-yard line for a gain of 15 yards. I think for John Huffnagel, Dave Dickinson, Rich Stubler, the, for the entire Calgary Stampeder staff, you, you understand that in these conditions, as we've said many times, there's a bit of an equalizing effect. But at the same time, while your, your execution may be impacted to some extent, you, you can't let it completely impact and control the the way that you play the game and your ability to be effective you've got to find a way to, to overcome it and that's a little bit of the mission here for the stampeders in the final 15 minutes so dave dickinson the offensive coordinator there who engineered one of the great cold weather drives late in the game with the bc lions to a west final win here in calgary throwing the last second pass to darren Flitty. and there's walter as a late flag comes down Walter gets out to midfield. The penalty is going against the Stampeders again. Holding Calgary number 26. Ten-yard penalty. Repeat. First down. Rob Cote, the fullback who has the Calgary touchdown in this football game, is called for holding. I think for John Huffnagel, he's going to look at this and see it as a sloppy effort in, in a lot of ways for his football team. 12 penalties for 115 yards for Calgary to four for Winnipeg for just 30. Yeah, and how many of those penalties can you actually blame on the weather? Now, pump fake by Mitchell, wanted to go over the top, can't find anyone open. Still looking down the field, and Astros out of bounds, and Levi Mitchell was being pressured there by Trey Harlan from the Bombers and Mitchell having a conversation with the receiver on the play. And Mitchell again forced out of the pocket here. Just trying to make a play along the sideline. Nick Lewis goes up for it. I mentioned the Bombers have to buy next week. So... A loss today for Winnipeg would equal the franchise's longest losing streak to end the season. Nine straight back in 1964. Right down two. Calgary the ball second down at its own 40-yard line. Mitchell's under pressure, and he is dropped. Sacked by Greg Hickman. Another first-year player along that defensive line for Winnipeg out of Tampa, Florida. Nowhere to run here for, for Bo Levi Mitchell. Every time he sort of picks his head up to try and take a look downfield, things collapse in front of him. See Jake Thomas getting a piece of him before Hickman he finishes the Stampeder QB. Bieber gets a good kick away to Cotton, chases him back inside the 30 yard line. Cotton had some room to run, but. Got chased down to the play by Calgary's Adam Tebow in the special teams tackle. So the Bomber defense keeping Winnipeg in it as Hickman records the sack. Back in Calgary, a reminder that on Sunday, it's Sunday Night NFL with the Baltimore Ravens going to Pittsburgh to take on Big Ben and the Steelers. Two of the great deep throwers in the National Football League going toe to toe. Would you like it? Pittsburgh. The Steelers fan? Nope. I think Pittsburgh's better. My team's the Raiders. Here's Devon Washington. He's up to the 44 yard line. I think next century will be the, the Raider turnaround. <laughs> say that last century. I did. <laughs> Meanwhile, north of the border, 
Demond Washington with his second offensive touch of the game. Yeah, a little two-way play for Demond Washington, who's played defensive back in this game, and a little bit of offense. Shoot to Kenny Plain. There you go. And dives ahead of the 51 yard line. That'll be close to Winnipeg first down, a gain of seven. Robert Marv continues to use his legs. Have a positive impact on this Winnipeg Blue Bomber offense. I wonder a little bit as we've had the discussion. I know the, the boys back in the studio did as well about the, the number of times that Drew Willie was sacked this year. That you wonder if maybe there may have been an opportunity earlier in the year to start. I'm not trying to replace Willie by any stretch, but to occasionally get Robert Marvin there if you're not comfortable with moving the pocket around a little bit more with Willie, but a guy who would, would be less of a sitting duck as a pocket passer. Marv has four carries for 27 yards in the game. And he's just short of a bomber first down. Well, you think back a couple of months ago, the five and one start for the bombers. The excitement for a franchise that had missed the playoffs four times in the previous five years, the beginning of the Michael Shea era, really looked like Winnipeg had turned things around. And then, second half collapse, eight consecutive losses. And a little bit of this, I think, has to do with the, the relative youth of this football team that when things started going sideways a little bit, to throw the brakes on that skid. Now third in the yard for the Bombers, and Marr for the second effort. Will be close and should have it. So where do the Bombers need to improve next year? Well, I... I how long do we have? I, I think there are a few areas, and... Milton and, and Schultz joined Lapo to discuss this a little bit in, uh, in the coach's playbook, but I think you'll see them continue to try to, to upgrade their Canadian talent. I mean, for me, Canadian talent has been an issue in Winnipeg for a number of years. The challenge becomes there, there aren't a lot of quick fixes to that necessarily. You rely on a couple of good, a couple of good draft classes and I believe that with Kyle Walters at the helm as their general manager, a guy who's very well versed in that area, I think that they have the opportunity to to start to build that part of the team. But but it takes time, and as you do that, of course, one of the important things is also retaining your guys. That these guys that you're investing time in in developing, but you want to make sure that you're not losing some of your top young guys through free agency, as as you do in fact develop. Down, Marr throws the sidelines and passes incomplete for Clarence Denmark. And Buddy Jackson was there on the coverage. Ten and a half to go in the fourth quarter. You don't see many teams try the two Calgary corners, Buddy Jackson or Fred Bennett. Well, it's a pretty good secondary across the board for these Calgary staff leaders. Buddy Jackson missed a few games, but they've got everybody healthy now. Clarence Denmark, so Marv got away from Quinn Smith, throws the ball up the sidelines for a gain of 41 yards. The biggest play of the game for Winnipeg is a first down deep in Calgary territory. Uh, you talk a lot about the, the quarterback having the internal clock, and Robert Marv, you see here, has got a little bit of a feel for just exactly how long he's got to get rid of this ball before Quinn Smith is going to get a piece of him. Signals to Clarence Denmark down the sideline as he rolls that way to turn it up. For a big game. Now from the 17 yard line, first down, Winnipeg. And on the first down carry, it's Sam McGuffey. First year man out of Rice University of Texas. So many of these new bombers are from the south, you wonder 
how they feel about their first taste of this kind of weather conditions. Well, and, and playing in a city like Winnipeg, notorious for getting a little bit chilly at, at this time of the year that some of these guys may have thought, well, if we're not going to make the playoffs, at least we're getting out of here before the weather gets too up. But, but they gave the Calgary. Game was four, second and six from the 12-yard line. Under pressure, throws, it's caught right at the six yard line. And the catch is made by McGuffey. And it will be a Winnipeg first down, so a fresh set of downs, first and goal from just outside the five. Uh, we spent a couple minutes talking about the Bombers in this rebuilding process, and to me, they took big steps in the past, this past offseason with improving job one, which was the overall state of their quarterback, and I think both in terms of what they're getting performance-wise and the depth that they have at the position, this is a team that's far better off than it was a year ago. I think they've got a starter they can build on with Drew Willie. Brian Brown, I think, is a solid guy, and you're, you're seeing flashes of Brian and like Robert Brown as well. First and goal, and the give goes to McGuffey, who dives ahead for a couple. It'll be second and goal from the three. Under eight to go. In the fourth quarter, the Bombers are looking for their first lead of the game. Calgary scored a touchdown when the field was still untouched by snow on their opening drive to Stan Peterson. A flustered. Just four points since then. A little bit of deja vu when you think back to the last meeting between these two teams. It was when Robert Mark came in. The kid just seems to have a back for making things happen. Second and goal from the three. Play fake to McGuffey. Throw to the end zone. It's broken up. Clarence Denmark was the intended target, but Buddy Jackson steps in front of that. And now decision time for O'Shea. And the field goal unit will come on. They'll try three for the lead. And they get Clarence Denmark as the lone receiver into the boundary looking for that man coverage. So he basically came to a complete standstill on his break to that out route. Kyle Jones is the holder. We've had, we've seen some issues with the snap for the Bombers. As Hyrule who comes on, so this will be a short field goal try from the 10. It through and the Bombers have their first lead of the game with 6.59 to go in the fourth quarter. The Bombers trying for their first win in 12 years in Calgary. The CFL on TSN is brought to you by GMC. We are professional grade. Apples of plastic, rubber, and snow come together. Field turf. And so now the Bombers with their first lead will kick it off with Hyrule who dribbles that down to Parker at the 20 yard line. And Anthony Parker gets out to about the 36 yard line. 6.52 to go in the fourth quarter. Bo Levi Mitchell and the Calgary Stampeders like to keep their hopes of at least a 15 win season alive. with 6.52 to play on their home field in the final home regular season game for Calgary. Here's what's the stake if the Stampeders win today and then again next week, they would tie the 89 Edmonton Eskimos at 16 wins, the most ever in a CFL regular season. Calgary three times before has won 15 games. Never before, though, in those three seasons has Calgary won the great guy. Mitchell lost the football, falls out of his hands, and the Bombers have it. The ball comes free, and Johnny Sears has his second fumble recovery of the game. Third. You're right, they did give him credit for the other. That's right, so he's got three fumble recoveries in the football game. And this is just a bad weather situation, and Mitchell without the glove on, on his right hand. Bo Levi Mitchell has worn a glove all season. 
in the summer, any conditions, he is not now, and the ball slips out of his hand. Weather again in the field position again with which the Stampeders have turned over the football. So the goal now for Calgary will be to limit Winnipeg to a field goal try at best. The gain was just a couple on the play. I think a guy like Bo Levi Mitchell, who he obviously played a little bit last season, but not necessarily at the end of the year in these conditions, is John Cornish. Yelling encouragement from the sideline, so second and long for the Bombers. Marr stands in and throws the pass is over the head of Barron Stenmark. It will be a two and out for Winnipeg, but Hiralahu now has a chance to extend the Bomber lead to four. Calgary defense does its job to this point. Just to finish that thought offensively. Bo Levi Mitchell, I think, trying to determine, as you heard John Huffnagel talk about, take advantage of playing in the elements. And I guess a part of that is determining what footwear, what equipment, and so on right. you need. Mitchell may be trying to determine for the playoffs whether the glove or without the glove is better in these conditions. Ira Lahu from 30 yards out puts it through. And Liram Hiralahu, who's had a terrific rookie season, the 24-year-old from St. Catharines, Ontario. Makes it a four-point lead. We asked Bo Levi Mitchell about the possibility of going 16-2. 16-2 is uh, overrated in my eyes. Um, I don't really think it matters too much what you're doing in the regular season as long as you're getting to the dance and you're progressing the way you get there. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's great for the organization, it's great for our team, and, you know, for the history books when you go back and talk about this team in 20 years. But uh, as of right now, I don't think it personally does anything for us. So it's more about, like you said, finishing. It's more that, that we get better, find out different things about ourselves, find out different guys that can play in different positions, find out, you know, different things we can do to be progressive as a team and uh, just find out ways to be stronger. I completely appreciate the, the sentiment of, of what he's saying there, but I think part of it, is, as I look at it, is maybe it's not about winning and losing down the stretch for the Calgary Stampeders, but I, I still maintain that for the Calgary Stampeders, if they play their best football, which is the goal at this time of year, they're going to win and they're going to get to that 16. Anthony Parker bounces off a couple of tackles. He's lost the football. The Bombers have it back again. Look says it all. John Hoffnagel talked to his team prior to this game about ball security. Sam McGuffey with the fumble recovery, the fifth turnover of the game by the Calgary Stampeders. Uh, this is exactly exactly where I was going with, with this point is the Calgary Stampeders haven't played anywhere near their best football right in this ball game. I think the point is, again, based on what they've done this regular season, if the Calgary Stampeders played their best football in the last two weeks of the regular season, they have a pretty good chance of going 16 and 2. The Bombers now set up at the Calgary 35 yard line. Here's Cameron Marshall on the carry. Bombers have turned the ball over twice in this football game, but we talked about it earlier. Calgary has had 10 games this year with one or no turnovers. Stamps are 10 and 0 in those games. Yeah, and it just it underlines the fact that this this hasn't been, regardless of weather conditions or anything else, regardless of John Cornish leaving the game. I mean, they they've played a lot of football without John Cornish this year. This hasn't been John Huffnagel's brand of Calgary Stampeder football, not with the ball on the ground five times and a blocked punt. Calls timeout with 4.56 to go. The 
Bombers now at the 33 yard line, second and seven. Clarence Denmark has the catch out of bounds at the 20-yard line. A gain of 12 and Winnipeg first down. Clarence Denmark, the go-to guy. In this Winnipeg receiving core does it again here. Change motion with the wideout. Calgary's only home loss this season early in the year to the BC Lions. Simpson. There'll be no gain on the play for the Bombers, but the clock's still running under four and a half to go. Well, the, the Calgary defense in all of this continues to stand tall. When you think about where all of the turnovers have occurred on the Stamps' open side of center. Yeah. And generally deep in their territory, the defense, other than block punt, has managed to avoid. Second and ten for the bomber. Barr stands in and throws. The pass is caught. And the ball comes out. Reaching out to grab it, though, is Corey Watson. He'll be short, it would appear, of a Winnipeg first down, but just short. They're marking him down just outside the Calgary 10-yard line. This is going to be really close. Watson's just going to run that quick flat. Ball out of the quarterback's hands quickly, but Keon Raymond closes before he can get to that first down marker. They're going to mark him down at the 11, so it'll be a full yard. And Michael O'Shea will set up the field goal unit now with a chance to make it a seven point lead. So Winnipeg just chipping away here, taking advantage of Calgary miscues. Calgary has 33 net yards in the second half of this football game. 33 net yards for the Stampeders. Team that leads the league in yards per game. So here's Harlahu from the 18-yard line. And again, he puts it through. And so if the Stampeders are going to make it 15 wins, we have a long way to go. Tough day of condition. Tyra Law, who's been pretty good for Winnipeg. Yeah, just keeps on ticking. Mr. Consistency for the Bombers. But I mean, you, you look at the field right now, and you yeah. see all the play has kind of occurred down here. You look down at the other end of the field, the ball hasn't been down there at all. The Snake Peters haven't had the ball and haven't threatened in the fourth quarter of this ball game one bit. The snow is untouched down There's there. no footprints inside the 10-yard no. line except the ones left by the snow shovels. So, 3.16 to go in the fourth quarter. Calgary down by eight. We think about some of the great CFL teams that have had tremendous regular season. One of the best ever, the 81 Edmonton Eskimos went 14-1-1. and And it took everything they had to beat the 5-11 Ottawa Rough Riders in the Grey Cup in Montreal. Uh, on any given day, you never know. Ira Lago this time doesn't dribble the kick. Parker takes it from the 15-yard line. Calgary needs a spark. And Parker gets tripped up at the 30-yard line as the stop is made by Winnipeg's Dan West. So, 3-10 to go. Bo Levi Mitchell has the ball at his 30-yard line. Calgary has more touchdown drives from deep at its own end than any other team in the Canadian Football League. That will be sorely tested today under these conditions in this situation. Well, in a possession-type ball game where you're, you're chipping away offensively, sort of trying to nickel and dive the defense a little bit, one guy that I'm surprised hasn't been more a part of the Calgary offense is Nick Lewis. And to me, this is a little bit of a, a Nick Lewis kind of ball game. The guy who's coming off a season high. Nine catches last week. Here's Walter with the carry, and Matt Walter has a first down. A flag comes down at the end of the play. Goes out of bounds. 
Up at the 42 yard line, but the Stampeders who have been self destructing on penalties will wait to see if this is another one against them. And it is. Holden, Calgary number 85. 10 yard penalty. Repeat. First down. Joe West has called for the, the three minute warning. And so the game will be negated. We've reached the three minute warning in Calgary. And frustration setting in for the record setting stands. Immediately following the game in Calgary, we will be heading to Edmonton where the Eskimos will be trying to lock up a second place berth in a home playoff game. They're going to beat the BC Lions and that man, Kevin Glenn, if they hope to do it. That's coming up right after the Calgary Stampeders and the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Here's a. Uh... Here's three categories for each team on defense that they're number one to go in the fourth quarter. Calgary has lost only two games in its last 22 in the regular season at home. And Bo Levi Mitchell going over the top for Mo Price. He dropped it. Wide open at midfield and Mo Price can't bring it in. And he recognizes that was a missed opportunity. Rare shot at a deep ball here. No help over the top for the defender. You'll see Mo Price takes the inside shoulder. It's Nick Lewis had occupied the free safety. Wow. It's one of those afternoons for the Calgary Stampeders. Yeah, you, you saw Price trying to take that one on his shoulder pads, which you'll see guys do a lot as the hands start to get a little bit cold and you don't trust your hands quite as much. Now on second down. Mitchell fires, and the pass intercepted. Picked off by Chris Randall, the former Calgary Stampeder, and another turnover. Takes the ball down to the five-yard line, the sixth turnover of the afternoon for the Stampeder. So a play after a drop at midfield. It's a pick by Randall, who's got his third of the year, and the Bombers are down at the five-yard line. John Huffman is going to challenge this, saying maybe pass interference by the bomber well, the, the question will be whether whether he came through the receiver so price the intended target calgary is challenging defensive pass interference on the previous play we'll review the play check that it was arthur was the intended target and randall came through now at the same time price is arguing pass interference here we'll see this Randall come, and there's there's a bump, a bump on the back of the shoulder of the intended receiver Jabari Arthur to come through and get that football. Now away from the play, Price was being held as well. So this starts to get interesting now, as Don Anamba had a hand on Mo Price. Defender in this situation, Randall's got a right to go for the football. Equal right to go for the ball in the air, but he can't go through the receiver to get it, coming from behind him. Making contact. As much as the game is football and you expect a little bit of a little bit of bumping. I have a feeling this one might be overturned. Now, I'm curious, does Huffman will have to challenge specifically that portion of the play, or can he say that Anamba was holding on the inside Mo Price? Well, here we'll get the response, but typically when a play is reviewed, if anything they see, yeah. they can... After review, we have pass interference against Winnipeg, number eight. The ball will be placed at the 39-yard line. First down, Calgary. So it's a first down for the Stampeders. Randall is called for pass interference. And with 2.21 to go in the fourth quarter, the drive stays alive. And no surprise that Mike O'Shea doesn't like that call, but again, it's one of those standards that's been applied very consistently by CFL officials. So a 19-yard gain. Ball is up at the 39-yard line. Calgary still has a timeout remaining. And lots of time to work with. And here's 
Walter on the draw play. And he busts up for the first down up to the 53-yard line, a gain of 13 yards, and the sticks move again. And Matt Walter busts out a couple of his best dance moves on this one. A whole little sidestep there, freezes Ian Wild. So 33 yards so far on this drive equals Calgary's second half output in the game. And here comes Walter again. Another first down into Winnipeg territory down to the 45-yard line. Crossing center for the first time in a long time. The Calgary Stampeders. Want to get some footprints deep in Winnipeg territory here. Two, three to go in the fourth quarter. Taking advantage a little bit of the fact that the Bombers were probably anticipating pass because it's been a pass-heavy fourth quarter for Calgary. Walters over 100 yards as well as Mitchell goes over the top. Nick Lewis has the catch. And Nick Lewis inside the 25-yard line. And John Cornish urging his teammates on. Don't tell him there's nothing at stake. And the Stampeders with a gain of 22 on Lewis's second catch of the football game. And a deep cross here for Nick Lewis, working his way across the field. Gets that inside position, little separation. <laughs> little Nick Lewis. Yeah. Off the shoulder, run through contact. Now the play fake, look out. Bo Levi Mitchell is sacked. Brought down by Bruce Johnson. Yeah, the Bombers send the pressure from the secondary. Johnny Sears under the pressure as well, and so Mitchell is dropped. And now it's second and long for the State Illegal contact. Hang on. Winnipeg, number seven. Ten yard penalty. First down. But Devon Washington is called for illegal contact. And another penalty influences this drive. Remember the pass interference earlier, and now this. Have a look at DeMond Washington. It's an inside matchup here. He's up close to the line of scrimmage to take on the slot. Stan Peters. Top of the 13 top yard line. Washington, because to me, the receiver initiated. First down. Mitchell under pressure gets loose. Looking towards the end zone. He is pushed out of bounds hard. As Ian Wilde gets a good shot into the Calgary quarterback, and Bo Levi Mitchell again. He's the dry as hands. He is not wearing his normally omnipresent gloves. And keeping that right hand dry is turning out to be an issue for the Calgary quarterback. You saw him get up and signal right away to the bench that he needed that towel, needed a little bit of help. Loss of four on the play brings up second and 14. As the clock is running. Just over a minute to go now in the fourth quarter. Four-man rush. Mitchell has lots of time. Throws in the corner of the end zone. It is almost intercepted. As diving back was Matt Buckner. Brings up third down now for Calgary. And the Stampeders with 56 seconds to go. Need at least 14 yards to keep the drive alive. A tough throw there for Mitchell with a couple of defenders going with Mo Price on that sort of flat corner route. It all comes down to this. You have to get down to about the two-yard line here to get a first down without scoring. Three months of the day after the last home loss. Dodrick finishing third and long. Mitchell throws the pass is incomplete. Nick Lewis moving over the middle. Mo Leggett there on the stick, and the pass ends Calgary's drive at the 17-yard line. And Nick Lewis just going to take it straight downfield. Nice job. And Johnny Sears, who's played such a key role in this ball game. Slowing Nick Lewis down on his release with a pretty good jam. It means that for Bo Levi Mitchell, that Nick Lewis is still in traffic when he's throwing that football. So you've got 51 seconds left. Calgary has a timeout remaining. So with a stop here, the Stampeders can still get the football back. 
but without much time on the clock. Marv in the shotgun. Gives off to Cotton. And Cotton with a good gain gets out to the 23 yard line. It's a pickup of six. Timeout, Calgary. So Huffnagel uses his timeout with 46 seconds to go. And the hope for Calgary now is get a stop, get the ball back, and have time for maybe two plays. Well, it won't be much more than that. Good job one here after giving up. Six yards on first down is going to be to step it up. Not let Paris Cotton do it again. Winnipeg's last win here was October 18, 2002. 11 consecutive losses in Calgary in the regular season since. Second down, market three. Here's Cut. Slices off, tackle, bounces off the first wave. He's fought close to a first down. As he gets across the 25-yard line, he needs almost the 27 to get there. And they're going to have to measure this, it would appear, with 40 seconds to go. If he's got it, the game's over. Still to come tonight, BC in Edmonton. Big matchup with playoff yeah. implications there. So here's the measurement. Just short. So what do you do now? Well, I'll tell you what, if I'm the Winnipeg Blue Bombers in my final game of the season, Sneaking. needing less than a yard, yeah, keep the ball. Don't risk all the things that can go wrong on it by kicking it away. Play to win. about a foot and a half. And on comes the short yardage team for the Bombers. Of course, Marv is their short yardage quarterback. He runs their quarterback sneaks. So the ball, 26 yard line. And the clock running. Calls timeout. Timeout. Winnipeg. Right before the ball is snapped. <laughs> He's talking that sideline of Michael. Get right in his ear to make sure he can hear you. Just winding that clock down as much as possible. So they'll say 20 seconds remaining and now it appears as though the punting unit is going to come on for Winnipeg. So basically reduce the risk. Run a chunk of time off the clock before you before you give the Stampeders the ball back. He just he just said run around a bit to someone I thought that's what he said. He's going to have Hyrule who go back and give up a safety here. I thought I saw him say, run around a bit. <laughs> what could go wrong, they said. And he is. So Hirolahu will run around a bit and give up two with 11 seconds to go. So now the Bombers will have to kick it away. The Stampeders are now down by six. Check that five, the score is incorrect. That was a seven point lead. Still to come, Saul Olivian and the BC Lions take on Mike Riley, the Eskimos. Kick off moments away.
in essence, what Mike O'Shea has elected to do, give up and giving up those couple of points is create an opportunity to try to kick the ball deep, give the Stampeders the ball back. So it is a five point lead. The scoreboard is correct. And 11 seconds to go. A kick now for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers from their own 25 yard line. So realistically, get a return. And if you don't return it for a touchdown, throw to the end zone, challenge pass interference no matter what. Yeah. So the kick is taken. Keon Raymond has some room to run, brought down at midfield. Three seconds to go. So now no challenge available. Right, because John Huffnagel has used his timeouts and has used a challenge successfully. So this is going to have to be. If you're throwing up a jump ball, it would have to be close enough that it's going to be reviewed by the command center, right. that it's going to be a forced review rather than one that the Stampeders could initiate. So here you go for the Calgary Stampeders. Down five with three seconds to go. And flags are down. Looked like Mo Price had gone offside there. Procedure, Calgary, number 60. Five-yard penalty remains first down. And they call it on Shane Bergman, the left guard, so that'll make it a longer play for the Stampeders now at their own 52-yard line. And you can see the effect the weather's had on our camera lenses, and salute to the fellows who have been outside for the last five hours setting up and shooting this football game. Here we go now. From the 52-yard line, Bolu by Mitchell. Three-man rush, Mitchell throws, the pass is caught by Price, he's built it down by Ian Wilde. And Mike O'Shea and the Bombers win their final game of the season. Their first win in Calgary since 2002, and Price is injured on the final play, stuck by Ian Wilde over the middle on a day in which they already lost John Cornish to injury. Price took a hellacious shot from Wilde as he made the catch. Uh, the, the Bombers finish on the high note of a big win. This is likely gonna be penalized on a helmet to helmet hit. And, and Price is still down. Yeah, I'm far more concerned than any penalty for the Stampeders is losing another of their key offensive cogs. John Huffnagel has gone right out to check on his receiver. So you think about Calgary and all that you didn't want to go wrong. Mo Price, who's a critical, critical receiver for this team. John Cornish, of course, their star running back was shaken up earlier. And the Stampeders have dropped their second game at home this season. Their last loss at home, August the 1st, to the BC Lions. Nasty, nasty yeah, collision. A, a huge hit and not suggesting that the helmet to helmet is intentional because I don't think for a second that Ian Wilde is that kind of player. It happens and it, it doesn't change the fact that it's it's gonna be penalized. And Price is now on his feet. So the Winnipeg season will end at seven and eleven. The Stampeders are now 14 and 3. They can equal the franchise record for wins of the season next week in Vancouver. For Dwayne Ford, Jermaine Franklin, all of us at TSN, I'm Gord Miller. Thanks for tuning in. Still more CFL action to come as we send you back to the studio with Jock Clapping in the panel. Thanks very much.